And okay, well, thank you for everybody for attending our first keynote virtual speaker series uh, at the MIT VCP Club. We have David Tisch, the founder of Fox Group, being interviewed and speaking with uh, Dean Huddenlocker of the MIT Schwarzman College of Compute. Isn't that how you say it? Yep, okay, we're good yep. there. Um, so I know the two worked together previously at the Cornell Tech, um, on the Cornell Tech campus in Manhattan. So uh, a lot of background between the two. So I'll hand it off to Dean Huddenlocker. Yeah, actually, maybe I'll give my 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 take on 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 our history together for a minute because it'll be interesting to hear David's take on it. So the the Cornell Tech campus grew out of a competition uh, that um, the city of New York ran when Mike Bloomberg was mayor, uh, and there were a number of universities that were competing, <coughs> and sort of, you know, being relatively local. I mean, you know, Ithaca is not exactly near New York, especially from a New Yorker's point of view, but we were nearer than many others. Uh, the team of us that were working on it spent a lot of time in the city meeting with lots of people in New York who, uh, you know, were integral parts of the tech startup scene there. And so we went and met with David uh, um, sometime, gosh, it's got to be a long time ago, 10 years ago now anyway. Uh, and uh, it, it was fun. We had a really good time. Um, we learned a lot from David about uh, he was rightfully very skeptical about um, what academia might really be able to pull off uh, that would be different than what academic institutions normally do. Uh, but uh, but um, but I left that meeting thinking, I'm not sure if he thinks I'm a bozo or not. Uh, <laughs> I've never actually asked him, but we learned a lot. It was a fun meeting and we learned a lot. I don't know if you even remember it, David. Sure. So I, was I a bozo or was I not a bozo then? No, 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 no. You were good. I, I criticized or questioned the timing of an academic institution. I think more than I questioned an academic institution, right? There are, there are schools like MIT or Stanford or Harvard Penn, which are these I went to Penn, so I have to include it. Um, these established institutions that I think have been able to have a huge impact and taken a long time to build up credibility to do so. And then I think on the other side, what you've seen, if you just map academia, academia to, to startups directly, um, it's, it's a gap other than this sort of rebel culture of students dropping out or slightly less rebel culture of students starting something immediately following school, um, there isn't a direct correlation between the academic institution and benefiting the early stage startup ecosystem. And I think Cornell Tech and in general, I was on the, um, whatever that was, Bloomberg's selection advisor committee to like pick which school was most interesting, everybody was pitching, we're gonna make New York City and startups in New York better next week. And you're like, no, you're, you're not. There's no chance you are. And I think that was the skepticism. But then you came along sort of two years later and, and offered me a, a job. And I said, I don't want a job. And he said, perfect, that's why we want you. And then, then I took your job. That's my definite approach to hiring. Yeah. People who want the job usually. <laughs> <laughs> and then I quit. When you quit, I quit. So it was a perfect ending for both of us. That's true. We both, we both. Uh, so Sunset. let me start, let me start with something, you know, beyond our history here a little more maybe, which is um, where do you think venture is and is going? Um, should I introduce world myself world? first and, and give any no. context or just start? Sure. Rambling? Go ahead. Everyone should know who you are, David. I don't know. Google. Um, I was just assuming, but yes, say, let, let, let's hear David. Let's hear David according to David. Because I, 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 I'm David Tish. I run a small early stage venture capital firm in New York called Box Group. We've been around for 11 years. Uh, we've invested in over 450 uh, early stage internet companies. Um, uh, we are uh, a team of six. We've been as small as two and as big as six. So uh, we're bloated right now. Um, we make about 40 to 50 new investments a year. And I've been running out that pace for over a decade now. Um, we are total generalists. We will fund things 
uh, across every single space. So uh, consumer internet and consumer services and brands, enterprise SaaS B2B vertical software, um, and then uh, really have built a, a pretty strong portfolio in healthcare, in fintech, and then what I would say is quasi life sciences and quasi sciences in the fa in the sense that like one of my partners took AP Bio in high school and therefore uh, thinks we're qualified to invest in uh, you know synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry. Uh, so we've done that too. Um, Prior to, to Box Group, I started an organization in New York called Techstars. Techstars is an accelerator program. I was a third employee at Techstars and launched and ran the New York program for uh, three years. We incubated 36 companies there, uh, left Techstars full-time in 2012 to do Box Group full-time. Uh, prior to that, I'd started and sold a company to a big dumb company called KGB, uh, not the Russian terrorist organization, uh, but pretty close to it. They answered your phone call if you called 411, so only the old people in the uh, room might know what that means, but uh, basically a contracts with Verizon, Sprint, and AT&T, uh, and I was charged with uh, running their internet division, which is another sign of a dying company, um, to basically take their data set and uh, figure out what to do with it. It's a 13,000 person company. Uh, it's this random entry on my LinkedIn, but I think uh, from a learning perspective, uh, the lesson I got there was when you work at a big, dumb corporate American uh, company you report to the CEO and you're charged with figuring out how to fix it, uh, you can learn an egregious amount in two years, both good and bad. Uh, and I would say a lot of my uh, core learnings came from that weird experience. Um, prior to that, I was a lawyer for one second, uh, graduated law school. I went to Penn and studied arts and crafts at Penn. Uh, and growing up, I was a hacker uh, who, who broke into banks to steal credit cards so I could go on America Online. Uh, my Mac crashed when I was 16, and I never learned how to code again until uh, I was about 26, and I tried to teach myself Ruby so I could interview potential CTO uh, co-founders on Craigslist, uh, all true stories. That's it. I'll pause there. So um, already a million questions to think about, but one comment, So, uh, or maybe a couple comments. So first of all, uh, David is, is way underselling Box Group, <laughs> which I knew he would. Uh, you know, um, the, they are by far the most active uh, and prolific early stage tech investor on the East Coast. And one My of partner the partner hates the word prolific, but well, I, I'm fine with it. Well, okay. So when I, I say- I'm good with it. That's a fine well, word. I should be clear though. When I say prolific, I don't mean spray and pray, right? So there, there, is, a, there is a model in early stage uh, venture investing of spray and pray. And I'll, I'll, I'll give a credibility statement. In our first uh, investment fund, we invested in 152 companies and uh, currently 19 of them, we invested at the seed stage uh, and 19 of them are worth over a billion dollars today and it probably will track to be about 23 of that 150. Um, and we are good if we fund three to five of 150 that hit a billion. So we, we've been good. 10 years ago, we were good. I don't know how we did yesterday, but uh, we, were, we were pretty good 10 years ago. And what's your biggest regret out of that first fund? So many. Um, I live in a, a, a state of regret. Um, it's true. It, you, um, the, the opportunity costs in our, our business are not making bad decisions and funding bad companies. It's, it's not funding a good company. And so... Uh, the second deal I ever got pitched was Zenga. Um, Mark Pincus, the founder, uh, I was playing professional poker online and got connected with Mark and I really wasn't doing much investing um, and didn't really know that I was going to be an investor for my career. And Mark, uh, I got connected to and he pitched me on playing poker on Facebook and I told him it was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I was, I was wrong. Um, and so you like, when you start your career with that and then watch that company like become literally like a defining part of the next six years of the internet and go public, I mean, you're just like, I can't fuck up this bad again. So let's see what happens. Um, oh, they have 15%. Most, more recently, we passed on scale AI, which I think is a pretty unique uh, category defining company. Um, we passed on, uh, what else? So many things. Um, you know, we passed on Casper mattresses uh, when they were not even named Casper and we did it 
uh, because that week we were looking at five brands and we said, we can't fund all of them. Let's just pick one. And I haven't probably run, uh, I haven't run like a quarter mile in the past decade, let alone like a mile since probably high school. And we ended up funding a direct to consumer running clothing company instead, which is idiotic. They're still alive, but um, that was a weird decision. So I feel like on a, on a regular basis, we make mediocre decisions. Although the numbers prove out, I mean, I think anybody who would have, you know, on the order of 15% of seed stage investments, uh, be billion dollar valuation companies, you're making, you're making a lot of good decisions there as well. Uh, because, the, the feedback, because I know how much you say no. The so feedback loop is hard, right? You, you don't, you don't get results in, in, and it's the same thing for a startup founder, which I think is, is hard sometimes. A startup founder, you feel it more and you understand uh, you know, day to day more where you're at. As an investor, you don't. Our feedback loop is somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 years. It's two years on a negative sense. Like if something you fund fails in two years, that's, that's a feedback loop. Success though, so we're in our first fund, we invested from 2009 to uh, basically 13. Um, we made uh, two investments in 2011 um, into companies called Plaid and another company called Airtable. Um, and if you had asked me in like 2016, so this is five years later, to identify the two best companies out of our first fund, I probably would have spoken about Blue Apron and I would have spoken about Warby Parker. Um, Blue Apron was the single worst IPO in the history of the public markets, which is fascinating to be part of. Uh, again, as a early stage investor, when you invest in a company that does a billion dollars of top line revenue, that's a great decision. But the eventual outcome wasn't as great. And we would have talked about Plaid and Airtable, which will likely be the two best companies out of that fund, as early interesting companies that we think might emerge. This is five years later, and I'm still viewing them as like adorable. And Airtable today is not eight years later after our investment. And I think the last public valuation is like $2.5 billion. They're still early. If you told me five years from now, Airtable has, you know, 10 X to what they are today, I'm probably not surprised. And so the timeline here that we operate on is incredibly long. And I think that um, for my business, that's something that like I have to accept and be okay with. And I think more importantly, it has nothing to do with you and your company and your entrepreneurial journey. That's my shit. And the more that I put that on you as a founder, the less you should work with us because that's my problem. It's not yours. And so I think one of the challenging things, I'm going to just rant for a second, but um, of understanding like this conversation is investors talk so much about their own stuff and making that relevant and connected to a founder who is going on an entrepreneurial journey and has a dream and wants to go build and fulfill that dream is so disconnected. And investors get pedestaled as important or interesting or um, smart or make good decisions, whatever the, these things are, or company builders, which we can unpack plenty. Um, and they're just not. The hardest thing in the world is starting a company. The hardest thing in the world is starting something from scratch. I have an idea. I am rebelling against the world regardless of what my idea is because either you are coming up with something that nobody's come up with before and trying to make it real. Or number two is you are saying, I have an idea. I see other people doing it. I'm better than them and I'm gonna beat them. And succeeding at either one of those journeys is so hard because you're starting with almost no momentum. And I think the, the relationship between an investor who has a portfolio and in essence a job, they have money that they manage, that money gives them a salary that they pay themselves 
And that money is guaranteed for basically eight to 10 years when you raise a fund. And aligning that with you who is putting every single thing on the line to start a company, you're, you're literally, your N is one, my N is 150. You're all in on your company. You wake up every day living and breathing it. And I basically answer your phone call when you call sometimes. There's no real alignment there. And so what's crazy to me about this ecosystem of, of venture backed or, or startups is that investors and founders are viewed as so much uh, in the same bucket, in the same conversation. But until you're living and breathing your startup, you don't probably quite understand uh, how separate those worlds are. So I'll pause there. So like lots of questions run through my mind um, based on this. So I guess one, one question is, uh, I guess it's a flip side set of questions. What do you look for in founders? What should founders look for in investors? And the third piece, just like to like completely overload your mind is, um, how much does what founders think they're looking for in investors affect whether you want to invest in them? If that made sense, but you yeah. can start with the um, first two. What do we look for in founders? I think, I think the uh, textbook answer, which is-, is Yeah, I know, but I want the real David- No, 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 I will, because I'll start, <laughs> but I'll start with the right framework answer, right? Is you look at this, this framework, it's team, it's market, it's product, it's idea. And then it starts going from, why is this team the best team to work on this product in this market right now? So this holistic view. And then the why now? Why is this interesting right now? Why is this possible right now? Is, is there something that's happened or is there some secret or unlock that you have to make it interesting right now? And then here's where it gets real. Do we give a shit? And it doesn't mean that your company's good or bad. It just might not be for us. If you're working on something in ad tech, I just don't care. I don't wake up ever and say, oh, please tell me about ad tech or monetization tech or digital media. Those are things that I just don't care about. If you are working in ad tech and can walk into our office and explain to us why your ad tech thing is like the one ad tech thing, maybe we'll care. But otherwise, we're not the right investor for you. If you are working in battery technology, I probably am not smart enough to help you or understand or anything. So unless you can dumb it down and make us interested in you, I probably can't get there. We've accidentally funded like a rocket ship company not because we can help with rockets or space or anything, but like they were so compelling that we got there and we funded like eight synthetic protein companies because at this point now we've learned enough about not just the science, but the go to market and the commercialization of some of the science to make that an interesting sector and the consumer behavior that's going to enable demand in that sector to be relevant for a company. So, you know, do I wake up and think about Kubernetes? I think I said that right. Like, no, I don't. Luckily one of my teammates does. So thank God he works for us. But like, if you came and pitched me this data optimization of like, I don't know, some technical jargon and you just start throwing buzzwords, is my head being like, oh, please tell me more. I'm gonna dive deep with you on that. No. Can I have a conversation with you to understand if your ability to abstract what you're working on and, and do it in a more commercial way is relevant such that I should bring in somebody to help me understand the depth of your technology? Yes. So um, that's what we're looking for. What, what is, unpacking that a little more. Um, sorry, I have to turn on my do not disturb. Um, Unpacking that a little more, um, we want ambitious 
determined, hungry, like killers. You have to want to see this through. It's a horrible decision. You're going to bleed along the way in so many different ways, mainly emotionally. And are you going to wake up and, and have the ability to see this through a trough? You talk about startups that are a roller coaster. When you hit that bottom, are you going to fight to keep going? You're, you and your co-founders are going to fight. You're going to lose a talented person on your team. There's all these, you're going to have personal life compromises that suck. And I don't want or expect you to like embrace those. You just have to understand the compromises that you are making when you decide to start a company. And that takes ambition and determination and, and grit. And so we try to look for that. We are early stage investors, meaning we typically invest on an idea, on a deck, on a demo, on you know, minuscule traction. So all we're able to judge is you and what you're telling us, how you're telling it to us, and, and all of these intangibles that are not math or science. So I believe my job is mostly art, minimal science. And we want, as an art, as somebody that understands that analogy, we just wanna like have something we like. How do I describe what I like? I don't know, that's pretty, that's cool, that's, that's interesting, that's it, right? And, and, that's the package. So that's A. Um, B, every investor is different. And the idea of grouping investors is a silly exercise. The second part is don't listen to investors. If I tell you why I don't want to invest, it doesn't probably matter. Find somebody who wants to invest. Find somebody that doesn't not want to invest for reason A, B, or C. Don't try to fix those reasons. Be who you are. If there's like a super obvious pattern that's emerging in all the feedback you're getting, sure, work on that. But in reality, just find people who believe in you and what you're working on and don't try to go fix the no's. So Pandora, 200 no's before a yes. How determined do you have to be to go to that 200 first meeting? Like literally they got shut down by everybody. They're like, we're going to keep going. We got, we're right. We're going to keep going. That's grit. Like that's, that's what tenacity is. You know that what you're working on needs to exist and just don't hedge it. Um, what was your, why should people work with us? Um, I don't know. Well, or yeah, or, or what, um, you know. Look, I think what, what expectations do you there see? There are very few investors in venture that are company builders. You should be able to do everything that you need to do on your own without an investor telling you what to do or how to do it. Even if an investor has built a company, the likelihood is that their company that they built is dated. They built it in a different era when different technology existed, when different company building tactics existed, when different culture norms existed, when different go to markets existed. So their ability to be like, well, I did this and here's what you should do. A, they're speaking from an N of one. They only did it at their company. That doesn't translate to your company. I, I use this out, like everybody probably watched the Facebook movie, the social network, like make your own movie. Don't try to replicate someone else's. There's a reason that was a movie is they, they were made a cool story. So like do your own, don't read a book and be like, oh, that's how you do it. Or so I think, um, on the investor, I didn't answer your question yet. On the investor side, um, the most important thing is money. The second most important thing is like good money. And then the worst thing is bad money. What does bad money mean? It's like an asshole. It's somebody who's just like going to tell you what to do, how to do it, like just position themselves as above you. That's not the right investor. But if you need money and that's the only money you can get, you should probably take that money. But you shouldn't try to take that money. The next is just money. And then the next is like good money. What does good money mean? It's somebody that you want to engage with for an extended amount of time. Maybe you want to just like talk to them and share your challenges, your frustrations, 
what's hard, what's working, what's not working. Maybe you want to ask for introductions and network and advice, or maybe you're going to sit down and go through the depths of your company because they're a board member or they're intimately involved in sort of the, the operational side of your business, but it's somebody that you align with. It doesn't mean you need to like them and it doesn't mean you need to like be best friends with them. It's somebody that you respect and want to continue to engage with. Um, and that's what you should look for is somebody that makes you like, one of the negatives that's happened over the past sort of five years is a proliferation of startups and investors has happened is startups tend not to go for people that ask hard questions. So if I go back to our meetings from 10 years ago to today, we stopped asking questions that are that hard because you don't like us when we do that. You're like, that was a hard question. You're mean, I'm out. We'll pick the person who didn't ask a hard question. And to me, like, we're not trying to blow up somebody's spot. We're actually just like pushing them to think about the edges of the challenges that they're going to encounter that we sitting at our 50,000 foot view are able to see and asking them how they're going to, to attack those things. And if I'm sitting in a founder's shoes, those are the people that I want to work with because they're going to, to challenge me and push me and not baby me. But that doesn't get rewarded that much. So instead, what we tend to do is, oh, that's really cool. That's awesome. So cool. Tell us more about how cool that is. And I think that that's a disservice to everybody because you're not getting to know us. And we're not sort of able to have that uh, transparent conversation with you in the process of, of building that relationship. Uh, and what was your third mediocre question? It's fine. We'll skip it. What was it? <laughs> I had a different kind of uh hot sort of uh, question about evaluating others, which is um, when you're looking to hire people, I mean, I know you have a very small fund, but in terms of staffing, you, you, you see yourself bloated at six, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but how you just do you hired think, an intern with a computer science background. So I feel like how, we, we how do got you, better. How do you think about hiring an early stage venture? Because certainly um, our number job, of people I our know, job, so as a lawyer, they want to work yeah. in it, early stage venture is high. <laughs> as a lawyer, as a uh, expert, you tend to have a, a knowledge that's about this wide and this deep. As an early stage investor, our knowledge is about this deep and this wide. I need to be able to show up to, excuse me, to a meeting and almost immediately establish a baseline credibility to have a conversation with you about whatever you're working on. So what that entails is a unique amount of intellectual curiosity that covers a huge surface area. I, in one meeting, need to talk to a 21-year-old uh, college dropout who, you know, she dropped out of USC. She's going to go build a high school social network. And she's doing it with avatars and bitmojis. Okay. The next meeting, we're talking to a company that's building construction SaaS, starting from a top-down perspective, you know, that is going to innovate the uh, architectural plans of commercial real estate uh, so that they get, you know, expedited time and money. And then in the next meeting, I'm talking to a database optimization company or a company that's trying to abstract a data scientist out of companies to do no code uh, so that, you know, we don't need to scale the amount of data scientists that are hireable by mediocre startups. And then the next meeting after that is a company that's reinventing hydrogen peroxide using a different formula. And I need to not look like an idiot in all four of those meetings. I don't need to look that smart, but I need to be able to make the founder think that we are interesting enough to work with to give us a shot to dive deeper into what they're doing. And on my side, I need the person who met that person to be able to judge that person, to bubble up that person and to say, that is an interesting idea, person, company, we should spend more time with them. And so as generalists, that's a huge amount of intellectual curiosity that you need to walk in with. And you need to have some scope of background that allows us to believe that you can do that. And so if you're a 22 year old just graduating college, it's not just an expertise, but it's, it's again, this width. So like what, what culture do you get exposed to for fun? What interests, hobbies, where do you spend your tinker time? 
all of those things become interesting. So on our team, we have a team of six. Um, we have a undergraduate um, you know, finance major, worked at a hedge fund, and we've been partners for 11 years. And so he sort of figured it all out on the job. Uh, and then we hired um, a woman named Nimi who went to uh, Harvard undergrad, studied economics, JP Morgan, Google as a, a associate product manager, HBS, did early stage investing at HBS. And, and that's like a great resume. But it doesn't explain why Nimi is a magical investor. It's that her empathy for a founder, her ability to connect with other people, and her unique ability to dive into a business on the spot and get to the core of why it might be great is off the charts. But you don't get that from that resume. We have a 20, he dropped out of college when he was 19. He's a computer scientist. He built iPhone games in high school. Then you know, became a VC instead of a founder. And he's obsessed with VC, but he is technical enough and spends time working on technical things on the side to like dive deep technically, but he's not going to build anything. He's just going to ask decent enough questions to understand how real something is. And so the team is multidisciplinary. We try to look at people for who they are and not sort of this specific type of resume. And then I think the other thing is like, you know, learning on the fly. So we, when we started, we're basically investing in like consumer businesses and some SaaS software. I never woke up and said, we should do life sciences. Thank God Adam did. But Adam has spent the past seven years diving into a sector to become really good at it to the point where if you threw him in a room with experts, he can ask and sort of stand up on his own. He's now obsessed with climate change. I am not. Great, we will make a lot of energy oriented investments over the next five years because he cares. A woman who joined our team a year and a half ago, Adina had sort of a consumer e-com background. Adina is insanely good at bottoms up SaaS companies right now. She has immersed herself in that world to the point where her knowledge and, and sort of level of uh, expertise of how those companies go to market is off the charts. And so early on when she was at Box Group, we would sort of funnel a lot of the consumer stuff to her, but she took it on her own to go figure out a different sector to the point where now she leans into those companies. And so I think that's the other side of intellectual curiosity is the willingness to go sort of learn things that you're not uh, exposed to. And then Super. the last one is like entrepreneurial empathy. And, and that's a weird word, but it means like you have to sit across from the, the, the founder and have them like you and, and appreciate that they are doing something really hard. Oh, so one thing I should have mentioned early on is if people have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll look at those as well. Um, I shouldn't be the only one lobbing things at David. But <laughs> so, um, so, so, so David, I guess um, one thing uh, that always, well, there are two things I found very interesting working with you at Cornell Tech. Uh, one was your ability to give a uh, very pointed critique that um, that still was somehow supportive, which I just find, you know, I think people often, uh, and maybe you're doing it less now, it sounded like, <laughs> because founders don't like it. But, uh, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a skill that I found um, something that I don't see very often. So that would be one possible place to talk about things a little bit. But then the other thing is I, I know from that time that you are, uh, at least then had very strong opinions about where things were or should be heading. Uh, and you know, you may feel that having been locked in your little COVID prison, uh, that your crystal ball has grown increasingly cloudy. I'm a, I'm a prepper. I fucking saw this coming now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that would be another interesting digression if people are, we can do that at the end. <laughs> like how, how ready David was for COVID, but anyway. <laughs> and for how many years he's been ready. But, uh, um, but just, you know, where you yeah. see the tech sector going, so think, where you see the I think it's the hard because I think going. critique wise, um, the best critiques happen from a place of trust. 
And I think what was nice about Cornell and, and is nice about something like Techstars is the organization is trusted. When you go to school at MIT, you inherently trust the people that MIT put in fr puts in front of you. You trust the organization, so therefore you trust the professors who are going to give you critique, and therefore it's coming from a place of warmth, in essence. And Techstars, you applied to Techstars, you chose to come join our program, they chose me to be the head of the program, so when I critique you, it's coming from a place of, of alignment and trust and, and comfort. What's really hard in, in the transactional nature of raising capital from an investor is there's no inherent trust. You're coming to us, you're pitching us on your business and we're shitting on it, well, you don't like me anymore. You didn't trust me to come when you came in. And so that's where I think the nature of, of a safe space in a non-douchey uh, way um, is vital. It, it establishes a trusted conversation where somebody can point out your vulnerabilities and point out your weaknesses, but hopefully you're not finding it to be a personal attack and it instead is a valuable critique that you can take and learn from. So to me, what's the abstraction of that? It's that you want to get to a point with other, you want to be vulnerable enough as a founder and vulnerable enough as an entrepreneur to build relationships that are trusted because those people are going to give you quality feedback that is worth taking to heart. It doesn't mean it's worth listening to. There's a huge difference. The person giving you feedback doesn't in, typically know what you should do. They are instead responding to what you've told them. And I think that that is important too. When people on pedestals and, and sort of in that trusted world, when an MIT professor tells you something, that person is inherently on a pedestal and you are just a student. They are the teacher. So you are looking up to them structurally. They still don't know what to do. If they knew what to do in your shoes, they should do it. They are in their shoes. So don't think that when somebody tells you what to do as a entrepreneur, or in, I mean, I would say it even more so like in your career, in your life, Nobody knows, nobody walks in your shoes. Nobody knows all the variables that you have in your life that you're trying to solve for. For my entire childhood, I was told to go into iBanking because that's how you establish like, you know, you pay your dues and you, I don't want to do that. So I went to law school because that's where you go to learn how to think, but that sucked. So I had to figure it out. And I probably took a little longer to figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. But at some point you learn that nobody knows what you should do or how you should do it. Everybody who's succeeded and, and sort of done something has done it in their own way and in their own style and in their own sort of steps. And then they turn around and they're like, here's what you should do. It's like, no, you should figure out your own shit and do it. And so I think that that's where the best relationships form um, is this idea of, of trust when you can have an honest conversation with somebody and get to know them. And those typically are not transactional. Those are typically long built relationships that do involve somebody getting to know you enough to give you quality feedback. Where I think we're good at the non long stuff is like you tell me an idea and I can poke at some of the challenges that you in inherently will face along the way because we've seen a lot of ideas. In my 11 years doing this, we've probably seen 30 to 40,000 startup pitches and you've not. And so if you're like, hey, I'm gonna build a social network that allows me to see where my friends are going at night. So if I wanna hang out with them and they're at the bar next door, I know they're at the bar next door. So this network will tell me that they're at the bar next door. I can tell you, cool, that is literally the first idea of like 97% of undergraduate entrepreneurs. You don't know that. You're like, I came up with a great idea. It doesn't exist. No app does that. But I can tell you like, hey, keep thinking. Or, hey, somebody might get there one day. Here is why the thousands of people that have come before you have not been able to get there so far. And we can do that in a lot of different sectors. Um, 
And then what was your other question? Well, actually, I'm going to switch to, uh, yeah. I got a couple of questions in the chat that may be more interesting than my next question. All then right. I'll come back to my next question. So, uh, so one of them had to do with going back to Blue Apron. Um, and, uh, and just uh, the, the, the question was around, uh, you know, how do you think about uh, IPOs versus um, earlier exits? And do you think that the sort of Blue Apron, uh, quote unquote, worst IPO ever uh, in, sort of informed your thinking on that in any ways? Um, we have never sold a stock early. Um, so in my 11 years of doing this, we've never once said, we are not aligned with the founder, we're gonna get out of this. And that leaves money on the table, but it maintains my alignment and my ability to say to a founder, I'm in it with you forever. When you end, I end. So it's not my choice. Um, I hope all of our companies find success. We had a company called Mirror. Uh, Bryn started it um, you know, four and a half years ago. From the day she started, and, and I'm okay telling this because she told me this from the beginning, all she wanted to do was sell the company. It's like whenever somebody comes along and gives me the number that I want, I'm saying yes and getting the fuck out of town. And luckily, Lululemon came along and offered her 500 million bucks and she signed that thing the day she could. Is that like, in the end, what, if you asked me when we invested in the company, how big could it have gotten? I could have told you, look at Peloton. It's a $30 billion company. Mirror had a path to that. Am I upset that Britain sold her company for 500 million bucks and has a life-changing amount of money and can go do whatever she wants to do for the rest of her life and in four years built a, a product from scratch as a non-engineer that some company came along and offered her 500 million bucks for? No, that was pretty good. Like, take that all day. So um, we're in it with the founders. And, and so you don't really have an opinion for, like, just, for if the founders come ask you, you, you ask them, is that kind of the... <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, I spend a lot of time advising our, our earliest companies at the very end for how they should think about it. We were the first investor in a company called PillPack. Uh, they sold to Amazon for a billion dollars a couple of years ago. And TJ and I spent a lot, I introduced him to the banker that helped him sell his company to Amazon. And then as he had a couple different options and offers and sort of issues within those offers of how much money should I get back to my cap table and, and investors, I said, look, like this is your moment. This is the chance that you have to make generational wealth for your family and your kids. And the idea that you should, it's not be ruthlessly selfish, but it's be selfish. You should be selfish here. This is not about sort of making everybody else better except yourself. It's make yourself as great as you can while not doing wrong to others. And so that typically is my advice is like, you get one moment to exit and you should maximize that value for you in the right way. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a few more of these before going back to mine. <laughs> and if they keep coming in and they look good to me, I'll keep asking the ones coming from the audience. So, uh, so there's a, a question about um, the fact that you have a very lean team compared to the number of portfolio companies that you all are invested in. Uh, and just sort of, how do you make that work? I, um, I mean, early on, when it was just Adam and I, and we were investing in 30 to 40 companies a year, my my biggest fear was that this model would break at some point. At some point, we'd just say, we have too many companies, they don't know us, we can't spend time with them, there's no relationship. The whole thing crashed and cracked. Then when we added Nimi and Greg in 2015, I think they said the same thing. They're like, well, this model can't scale, there's no way this is gonna work, at some point this cracks. It, 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 that is the one thing I am certain of is our model doesn't crack. It is incredibly hard on us, but it doesn't crack for the founder. At a given moment, there are 20 to 40 companies that we are actively working with. Those are the newest investments. Those are the ones that are struggling. Those are the ones that need to raise their next round of capital. And those are the ones that are at some inflection point and have picked us to help them think through it. Everybody else we're triaging. The analogy that I use is, um, 
imagine a room filled with like helium balloons that are, are losing steam. So they're not on the ceiling anymore and they're coming down. My job is basically to run around the room and push the balloon up so that no balloons hit the floor in terms of our relationships, but all the balloons are relatively high enough, hopefully above like chest height. And so if I'm just running around the room, maintaining a bunch of relationships, that's my job. And we've been able to do that pretty uh, magically. I think, you know, we care about whatever version of MPS reviews, feedback we get. And the way we get it is founders reference check us. Founders don't take our money unless they talk to people who've worked with us who say really good things about us. And so uh, that's how we know how we're doing and, and we're doing pretty good at that. Yeah, that's great. Um, Cause I think, you know, one of the things is, you know, again, you're, you're super early stage. So, um, but, not but a lot company of building. The, right. A lot of the VCs later on somehow, you know, try to sell that they're going to, you know, help you with the day-to-day -day of running your company, which, which you know, in, in your opening, you said you don't believe in and people shouldn't be looking for that in their investors, which, um, but, uh, but I think that, that it's, uh, it's just great to hear how, how, that, how that works. Um, so then I, I sort of, before we started, I said I was sick of COVID, but actually there's a, there's a COVID question here uh, that I do think is kind of relevant, which is, um, how has it affected your ability to uh, build relationships with new founders and, and how has it affected your investing during this time period? We're incredibly lucky. Um, we're New York based and we've been New York based since the beginning and we fund about 50 to 60% of our investments in San Francisco and the Bay Area. We've been remote investing since 2011. So our investment in um, Amplitude, which is an MIT uh, computer science graduate, um, our investment in PillPack uh, and our investment in Airtable were all done remotely. So we did those in 2011 and 12. We actually never met, we met Spencer like a year and a half after we made the investment into Amplitude. We were out in San Francisco, like maybe we should meet, we met. Um, you can build relationships on video, you can build relationships on the phone, you can build relationships on the internet. That it is just sort of like look at the medium and, and figure out how to build a relationship. It takes different skill set. I don't believe that shaking someone's hand or looking at them in the eye is like this magical unlock of relationships. It's sort of weird and antiquated. And I prefer not touching other people because then you get COVID. That's terrible. Um, so I, I think that you have to adapt. As a team, we've been working remotely since March. You know, there's other organizations that want to rush back into an office because they miss the camaraderie or the, the ch casual chatter. Like, we're good. We're, we, we're not rushing anywhere. So we talk more. So we used to do one weekly meeting. Now we do three. We chunked it out a little bit more. So you just figure out the things that make your flow work better. And in addition to our three forced scheduled weekly meetings, like we're constantly communicating as a team. And me as the sort of manager, I call my teammates casually just to chat, hang out. I figure out how to replace those sort of informal moments. You have to force it. So um, how has it impacted us? I think COVID has impacted, um, the coolest thing, and, and I, I wonder if maybe someone here has the answer, you can email me. David at Box Group. Um, I have yet to find a single thing that COVID has created that's brand new, net new. COVID has accelerated things dramatically. COVID's accelerated the adoption of telemedicine. COVID's accelerated e-commerce. COVID's accelerated, obviously, work from home, remote uh, work and sort of remote collaboration, distance learning. But none of these are net new behaviors. So other than like selling and wearing masks, which was actually happening totally, you know, uh, broadly in Asia, um, I haven't figured out a, which is crazy because you're in this like total change of the world paradigm and there's not a single thing that I've been able to identify that's net new because of that. And so uh, if you figured it out, let me know. Um, uh, and then, yeah, that was, that was it. So I guess, yeah, I should do, since you went by it in passing, I should, so, so D David is, um, 
is a class A germaphobe. <laughs> <laughs> which, which my, always wife made... is, my wife is the exact opposite. So I don't even think I'm that bad. She's just like horribly not good. And so I, I <laughs> sleep on a, a I'll, better I'll, side I'll, of it. I'll side a little more with her, frankly. But, uh, the, <laughs> in the, you know, like in a classroom, right? You know, people come up after class. And so David was teaching some classes at Cornell Tech that, you know, probably had 150 students in the room, something we certainly aren't doing at the moment. Uh, and, <laughs> And, and they'd come up and David would back further and further away. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't, I, the shaking hands thing's weird. We yeah. And so, uh, and so hands. he finally had the class trained, uh, you know, no that, touching. That, that the closest you could do was like an air fist bump. Yeah. You shouldn't actually contact fists, but you could kind of, you know, get. Which seems like a reasonable decision now. I was it right. does. It yeah. does. So I was going to say at the time. It seemed like some sort of bizarre paranoia, <laughs> and, uh, and and actually, uh, the Cornell Tech location out on Roosevelt Island may have been the one of the only times David ever rode the subway. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> Close. Uh, again, for the same for the same reasons. Not because you any, not because you have anything against subways. No, just no. A lot, it's, it's, a, lot, yeah. a lot of people crammed in there. Look, I, I um, think I look. I. I, I frankly think COVID's been a great advancement in so many things. It's a horrible disease. It's, it's the amount of pain and suffering that it has caused. My parents uh, had COVID in March. My mom is, you know, wheelchair bound with advanced MS and she is at the top of the risk profile and incredibly lucky to have survived it. My 91 year old grandmother got COVID and didn't sniffle, which is just magically fortunate. So uh, there was a month period when the three most vulnerable people in my life at the peak of COVID had COVID. And so um, I think from any like empathy and, and intensity, I, I lived it. I have a 40 year old friend, healthy as can be, who dropped dead. Um, they haven't confirmed it's COVID, but like that's pretty logical in the middle of a pandemic for how that. So I in no way am trivializing COVID. So I just want to preface it with personal empathy and, and stories. But I think COVID has taught and hopefully coming out of this episode of, of insanity in the world, we'll hopefully do things better. Like if you go to Japan and ride the subway, it's a magical experience. There's a like sophistication, both of cleanliness, of performance, of quality that is, is magical. And if you go to New York and ride the subway, it just, there's, less care and there's less like um it's just different and i think that if we as a society can figure out how to be better and rethink things and um do better and i'm saying this in the middle of some clusterfuck of our country and, and politically whatever but um i just hope because i at the end of the day as an early stage investor you are inherently like a magically optimistic person because you are funding the future. Uh, I do hope that this has given us, and I, I wish we actually felt it from a, a national standpoint, a sense of an ability to reset and actually like do things from the ground up in a better way. That's education. It feels like has an opportunity to be better. Logistics and transportation and uh, sort of city building and all of these things, right? New York City's example is outdoor dining. COVID has opened up the ability to eliminate useless parking spots and turn them into a like enchanting uh, ability to use the streets in a repurposed way that our idiot mayor is at least capable of seeing is, is worth holding on to. Um, and, you know, my hope is that in healthcare, right? So telemedicine, telemedicine didn't exist, not because it doesn't work and not because the technology didn't exist. It didn't exist because in uh, payers and payees and insurance like screwed the system. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't reimburse a doctor the same amount for a telemedicine visit as an in-person visit, which forced you to go to a doctor's office when the doctor could have done and should have done their work on video. So hopefully there's, you know, medical licensing. So if you were a doctor in New Jersey, you couldn't work in New York unless you jumped through thousands of hoops. During COVID, Congress paused the licensing requirements to allow a flow of doctors across state lines. That's a positive for society. If Alabama doesn't have enough doctors, like let's get Alabama doctors and not make doctors have to suffer to become 
capable of helping people in a state that needs it. And so my hope is that COVID has, has improved our society. It probably isn't going to do it this year. Uh, this year's not good. Um, but in the future, that, that sort of is the hope. Awesome. Maybe, maybe we could do one or two questions and then people can get, uh, get ready to walk over to class. <laughs> no, yeah, but I was going to say we're probably running up on uh, end of time there. So, um, so I guess there was another question here in the chat, which is, you know, you, you in your sort of narrative uh, intimated that um, sort of uh, portfolio management for you was really kind of driven by individual curiosity and then uh, you know, sort of maybe individual investments then turned into groups of investments. But do you all think uh, sort of strategically about portfolio areas? How do you sort of look at, um, you know, what areas the fund is in? We're, um, in? Yeah, we're, we're generalists. We are opportunistic. And so that's the core of it. We sent out an LP uh, update two days ago. And in there, it states we're generalists and we're theme agnostic. And here are three themes we're really interested in. And um, I think that's what it comes down to is, is Adam, my partner phrases it nicely, we have prepared minds. And if we don't have prepared minds, when that opportunity walks in your door, you're not ready to understand how interesting it is. And those prepared minds are, are wide ranging and wandering. You know, we are as a firm historically before our current fund, about 15 to 20% healthcare. Our current fund is 4% healthcare. In the past year, uh, we've made 65 investments, which is higher than ever before. So COVID has created more, not less investing. Uh, and only 4% of our healthcare, which is like way under average. That's not because we have made a thesis decision not to invest in healthcare. We just haven't seen the stuff that gets us excited enough to pull the trigger. And so we do think about portfolio construction. We do think about valuation and entry point and all these other different issues within there, but we are at the core opportunistic and generalists. And so it's not done at like, we haven't seen healthcare, let's all orient our, our resources to go hunt for healthcare deals. I, I assume the wave will come. We were fighting to get in one right now that we think is interesting. And so, um, you know, that'll be 5% then, and, and we'll go from there. Great. Um, last question, what is it? I know, I'm not sure I have a last question. I always hate last questions. Do you have a last statement? <laughs> um, I'll, put, I'll I, put the last yeah, question. I, yeah, ask, ask sure. yourself a question. Yeah, you have I got, um, you know, we as a firm and David as a human, um, you guys are at MIT. You're really uniquely smart. You're, you, we deeply believe in the credentialing and qualifications that other organizations put up front. If you want to work on something and are interested in sharing it with us, we'd love to hear it. We will pedestal people from MIT. I told Dan when he uh, left Cornell that he at least upgraded. Um, and I meant it, right? Like if you go to Cornell, you're going to like a safety school. If you go to MIT, you're like an elite person. Um, and it means that like there's an inherent talent in each one of you and curiosity and, and skill set that as an early stage investor, uh, we'd love to hear more about what you're thinking about if you're at the idea. So I guess my last question is like, when is it too early to talk to an investor? The answer is never if you want to start building a relationship. And I think that that's, um, you know, totally something that as you're ideating around spaces, if you want to just get on our radar, uh, reach out. It's david at boxgroup.com. Uh, mention that you, you heard me rant and uh, hear it and tell me I was funny because then I'll, I'll like you. Um, and then uh, we go from there. And, and he is funny. <laughs> Even if you didn't pull it off here. No, just kidding. All, this, all the non-video faces are so hard to read. You're like staring at the guy in a mask. Daniel, thank you. You've given me zero facial expressions throughout. So uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that but was they, but they, They're on campus. They I'm not judging. I'm just saying as uh, the Zoom thing fucks you up because in a normal live audience, you can like find your two fans and just speak to them. In this, it's like, please, well, hopefully you like fans, us. So. It's, it's hard. Uh, so, thank uh, you guys very much for, for speaking.
spending time with me. And, and maybe I'll quasi publicly say so that it forces me to really deliver on it that David and I are thinking of doing something together over oh, IAP. We're doing it. Thinking is such a passive word. It, all right, David and I are going to do something together over IAP. So help us figure out what it should be. Yes, and take it so that I'm popular on campus. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, Thank really you, appreciate guys. it. And, uh, and yeah, great to have you, David. Great to see you, Dean, on Locker. Um, and yeah, more exciting events to come in the next few weeks for the club. So take a look at uh, Sloan Groups and we'll, we'll remove the passwords going forward, make it easier to, for people to come in. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, thank you. Thank Appreciate you all. It. Bye, guys.